coolest thing about the guy? The coolest thing about the guy is his understanding of management and power structures and how to create a workforce, how to actually organize a workforce based on principles of good manners, really, and actually you could motivate them and get people working much better using a combination of statistics and just decency. Um, and I, I, I always like Debbie. Now, if you, if you, if you did, he was, yeah, this is the guy who was credited with all, they all. I'm going to talk a little bit about Deming first. I kind of mixed it a little bit up. Um, um, I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit about Deming, and I think I'll end with this. I'll, I, I, um, I urge you to read a little bit about his principles, because it, it, effectively what he is is simply a good manager. He listens to what people have to say to them. There was a way of... Um, uh, this idea behind you grant power to people by giving them authority to make decisions uh, and as long as they, you know, de decisions having to do with the way that they're associated with their production. So you grant power and distribute the power amongst the organization in a much more realistic way. So it's, it's a way to improve on the top-down organization. I think this was Devin's <coughs> great, um, great contribution. Now, None of this at all would have been possible without Fayol. Fayol died in 1925, so it was sort of the time that Taylorism was coming in. And he, um, he worked in the Cole Superior de Mines in, uh, in France, which was, it still is, one of the great, the great universities of Europe. And um, worked in mining, and mining it's, was, quite, was, was becoming more technically sophisticated. And what he did was come up with a, a system, the primary, primary, primary functions of management, which is planning, organization, leading, controlling, controlling, coordinating. And it is it's a perfect, perfect time to actually stop this lecture, because this is really where um, the project management starts. And if you look at the um, REBA plan of work, if you look at any of the project management software, it's really all based on these, on these five key, key activities. Um, now I've left quite a little, I've left quite a bit of these slides un, un, um, unspoken, um, but I wanted to jump uh, to the very end of this and talk about data-driven activities and the way that um, the way that we should prepare for, for the future, which is quite, a de I guess, a, a departure for, from, from the current practice. Um, so I wanted to talk, um, just in a way to finish <coughs> things up, as um, PM in the data-driven area. And um, what's happening is that um, project management, civil engineering, built environment in general, it's shifting from um, a kind of a commoditization of the production system. So we're giving things in, in, in little units. We're providing five days of consultation. Or we're providing 27 bathroom pods. And uh, we're, we're, we're providing 433 wall panels. Everything's becoming commoditized in such a way that it changes the very nature of how, um, how the finances are being done, how money, the money, the way that the money is moving around in the system. Um, as a result, um, as a result of this, there's all sorts of new ways to finance, to pay for these things. Everyone has to, everyone gets an order, has to find the money to, to fill the order. And, uh, and this has had sort of, it's not a top-down system anymore, it's highly fragmented. Um, and we're moving, um, we're moving from commodities to flows. So the interest of project management isn't to order a bunch of components and um, assemble them in the right way. But the, the, the emphasis is now going to be in managing flows of systems. And the only way that we're going to conquer or be able to master the, um, to be able to master the, uh, uh, the only way we're going to be able to master the, the new smart cities is by actually understanding how flows work. And, um, 
So there are flows in the infrastructure, the way people move throughout the city, the way traffic moves, the way waste is, de de is, uh, is, is taken away from the city, the way the water supply, these all have to do, the money is going to be in managing the flows. Um, and um, just as a way to kind of show you that someone else is thinking about this, there's a whole series of, of companies at CB Insights um, that are doing smart cities. So these are all companies involved in some way, most of them managing the flow of data, the flow of information, uh, the flow of materials. Um, actually, this has quite a big, a big impact on the way you will run your, your, your careers would develop. You're going to be dealing with BIM, which is essentially a, a data-driven or a data management system. Um, you're going to be um, dealing more in communications and less in uh, sort of traditional engineering. And uh, the most advanced companies around are ones that are already very much clued into this uh, new thing. So the, the future has to do with the management of, uh, of, uh, of, of data and flows and um, things like AI and artificial intelligence and how to manage this data, the appropriate way to, to budget these things, um, blockchains and how to record transactions and so forth. Um, we'll will be um, uh, will be uh, will be pr pr persistent, and I guess um, the the startling thing is how organizations make use of this data. I mean, we all know about Facebook and and uh, YouTube and how they manage and control. Uh, our phone company seems to know more about where I am than, they, than I know. And in fact. And in fact, they start, I don't know if you notice this, they start delivering messages to you. You think about, oh, maybe I need a new bicycle. All of a sudden, something pops up, need a new bicycle. How do they know that? And it turns out that they know it more than I do, because I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about dinner. I'm thinking about my next assignment, so forth. Um, but at the same time, they're seeing where I'm going and how I'm getting there. Um, so it's the mastering of this, the particular data flows associated not, with, not only with entire communities of people, but down to the individual themselves and, um, and what his needs are, what her needs are, compared with that. So I think that this, um, on this note, I will end this lecture and open it up to questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Just a quick point, George. You were talking about the smart cities, right? The smart cities. The smart cities. And we've got the uh, global warming. Yeah. If the pace of global warming is too quick, do you think smart cities will get higher on plan is going to adapt that? It's a good question. I mean, the, the, the most in, well, the most advanced, the most advanced smart city right now is in is in Toronto, and it's done by Sidewalk Labs, with, which is a subsidiary of Alphabet. You know, they also own um, Google. So okay. Google is actually building a. Um, a smart city in Toronto on a former wasteland that's prone to flooding. So, you know, marginal land. Cities are always built on wasteland. You know, the, the new cities are going to be built on wasteland. Um, however, hopefully they're going to do some engineering and do some remedial work. I mean, they have to, apparently they have to do this tens of millions of pounds, dollars worth of uh, just basic engineering work that goes in to keep the place dry um, before they can actually build a smart city. But if the pace on pace is the technology. I, th I, I honestly think that it's a, if, the, if, the, if the pace of building smart cities outpaces the technology, and there's a, it's a race of time against um, global warming and sea level rising. Well, yeah, the most vulnerable place the most, okay, there's two sorts of vulnerable places. One, where they're not prepared, and the other vulnerable place where they are prepared. So if you go to possibly the most vulnerable place, low-lying place in all of Mars. Europe, yeah, Belgium, Benelux, um, Netherlands, yeah, and yet if, when, when it comes to big storms, when it comes to sea level rising, I, there's very few places I would rather be then in the Netherlands, even though you're six meters below sea level, you've got 100, 150 years of excellent engineering and organizing and preparing for things. And there's talk right now of 
big contracts coming to civil engineering companies in order to improve our our um, shoreline, our our coastal infrastructure, building dikes, relocating cities away from areas that are bound to pro are prone to flooding. Um, did you hear about the flooding in Isle of Man this morning? I heard about the flooding in Isle of Man two days ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's just um, I'll get I'll get more into this. We you know we're we're entering an era where we should expect more extreme events, including heavy rainfalls, wind, sea level, sea levels, you know, sea surges, you know, storm surges associated with with hurricanes and with violent um, violent anticyclonic behavior. You know, so it's we're entering into a kind of an area where these things will come. At the same time, the sea level's rising. Um, there's more erosion along the, the coastal areas. It forms, a, the storms are more intense. Um, it's opening up a whole new area. And I, I just, I guess, I'll, I guess the good time to close is the, the IPCC, uh, the International Panel on Climate Change, has in the last year published three new works. Um, three new reports. One of them is on 1.5 degree, you know, what, what does the world look like 1.5 degree um, global average warming. Can you read that, yeah, I'll, I'll put them up on, I'll put them up on Moodle. I have, I have copies of all three of them. I've read through them, most, spent most of the summer reading them. And the other one is on land use, and that's particularly relevant to our industry. How is land use both accelerating and combating global warming, what does that actually mean? Uh, includes water supply, which is particularly relevant to us. And the third one is on the oceans and the cryosphere. So the oceans and the ice. What does that actually, what's actually happening? And the IPCC is an international panel, so they don't actually commission or do any of their own research. What they do is compile and write um, extensive reports. So I think these reports are about a thousand pages each. And the most relevant bit to us to understand is the, uh, the summary for, dis for uh, decision makers. So I guess we're decision makers. We're, we're actually going to be making use of this. And I'm going to talk more and more about these three I IPCC reports, bits and pieces as we move along. But they're all relevant to, um, to uh, they're all relevant to our profession. They're all relevant to civil engineering and to the built environment, to infrastructure. Um, but they're also relevant to commerce, to migration, to trade, to shipping. Um, so it's an, our entire sort of civilized life is kind of wrapped up in, in, in quite rapid and dramatic changes. And um, I mean, I think the real question you're asking is, is the technology sort of sufficient to combat or to to um, confront the changes, that, you know, the changes on one hand, the technology on the other, you know, who's going to win? Um, and uh, I don't have an answer. <laughs> I know who I'm rooting for. <laughs> I know who I, I know who I want to win, um, but the um, but it's still it's still up for grabs. What's actually going to um, what's actually going to happen? How it's actually going to evolve? Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. See you, yeah, see you Monday.